All right, cool. So I'm Wes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a um, kind of a, a narrow but interesting problem that we've had um, uh, in the process of scaling up Sharpie. Um, so uh, pseudorandomness randomness in JavaScript, this is actually not my title. Mike came up with this. Um, I think it's a pretty good title, I guess. Uh, uh, I can go up with a, with a better one, so, so that's it. Um, all right, OK, so first, a quick overview of, um, of Charpy. So we are a real-time analytics company. Um, you, you, you can think like Google Analytics except for um, sort of two key aspects. Uh, the things that we measure are slightly different, um, and we also uh, produce uh, displays on those measurements in real time. As in, um, you know, where we have an SLA that says something like, uh, if something happens on your site within six seconds, it'll show up in your dashboard. Um, in reality, when something happens on your site, it shows up in your dashboard probably in like, like less than a second or two seconds. Um, so this is an example of one of our Charpy dashboards. Um, just, just out of curiosity, uh, who, who's actually like heard of Charpy or used Charpy before? All right, okay, cool. Who knows what the difference is between Charpy and Charpy for publishing is? It's like one person way back there. Okay, uh, and who has heard of Charpy uh, for? I think the I think the new product title is Charpy for publishers with advertising. Okay, absolutely no. Okay, so. Um, uh, the, the, the major difference actually is that, uh, so Charpy uh, proper, which is, which is the, the dashboard that you get when you just sign up for, uh, for the product on our website, um, that's, we kind of refer to that as like the basic product. Um, and then there's Charpy for publishing, which is, uh, which is more tuned for, uh, for larger content creators, so places like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, like very, very big sites. Um, Charpy for publishing also has like various other features like um, uh, you send them reports and things like that. And there's Sharpie for, uh, for publishing with advertisers, and this is a, uh, an advertising product integration. Uh, in all of these cases, we're, we're measuring kind of the, base, the, the same sort of um, basic uh, unit or basic concept, I guess. That's, that's of engaged time here. So engaged time is uh, the amount of time that somebody has spent on a page while doing something. So uh, specifically, the things that we look at are: um, Have you moved your mouse? Uh, have you typed? Have you pulled the screen? Has your screensaver come on? <laughs> All right, sorry. And I can't even I can't even see it. I'm seeing the other right there. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. This this angle is a little funny. Uh, All right. Um, okay. So. Uh, uh, and then, uh, oh, right, okay. so the things uh, we we look at um, how much time you're spending on on uh, on the page while you're uh, moving your mouse, scrolling the screen, or you're typing. These are all like very strong indicators that you're actually reading the page. Um, and then the Sharpie for publishing for advertisers product does the same thing, except that it's looking at not uh, not the amount of engaged time on the page, but the amount of engaged time on ad units on the page. Um, so the advertising product is more of like it's more of an, of an optimization problem. We like. We show publishers how to uh, how to optimize certain ad units and things. Um, whereas uh, Chartbeat and Chartbeat for Publishing is a real time analytics thing. This is more like a dashboard and like pretty graphs and stuff like that. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, what's going on in uh, in the real time action here. Um, okay, so when you go to a uh, a page that um, uh, that is running Chartbeat, uh, what happens is um, your, your browser loads up this Sharpie.js code, and then we start sending what we call pings um, to our servers. Um, the normal terminology, or the more uh, widely accepted terminology, I think, is, is, is a beacon. Um, for historical reasons, we call them pings. So that's, you, you can see two pings right here. You can ignore that one for now. But these, these two, uh, they're, they're basically uh, collecting information about what's going on in the page, like things like uh, how far down on the page are you, like have you typed or moved your mouse in the last five seconds. Um, and it sends that uh, it sends that in one giant query string to um, uh, to our servers. So this happens. Um, the exact time period between things varies depending on what's going on, but generally it happens every 15 seconds or so. So when this page loads up, um, you know, in a typical session, if you're on the page for uh, for one minute, we might send four pings to our servers, and then our servers have to be able to take those four pings, um, collect up all of the data, and do something useful with that. So one of the, of, of the ways in which we collect these pings up is that um, uh, we assign uh, two unique IDs to the pings, one called the U key and one called the T key. 
The tiki I'm not going to talk about. Um, it's it's um, you know it's not interesting for this talk. But the yuki is is basically a unique identifier for you on that site. Um, so so the yuki is uh, uh, you know across all of the people who are going to all of our customer sites, the yuki uh, needs to be reasonably unique. So there there are a couple of things I should talk about here. Um, uh, some uh, some technical and sort of legal limitations. Uh, one is that we only use first party cookies. Um, this is for privacy concerns. So what this means is if you are on, um, on the New York Times uh, and then you go to the Wall Street Journal, we can't link your activity between those two sites up. Right? So this is a, a feature for our customers. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the second thing is because our code is being loaded up, uh, on all of these pages, on, you know, we, we're on 80% uh, of the largest publishers in the US. Uh, our code is getting loaded up all the time. It needs to be small, it needs to be fast, and it can't really affect uh, the user experience very much. Like, we could take down the internet if, if you know, not if we wanted to, but, uh, <laughs> but if we weren't careful. Um, so uh, so the, uh, the tribu.js code is very tightly controlled and is very small, um, and it needs to be simple and uh, understandable. Um, a third thing is that the, uh, the tribu.js code has to work in all browsers. Um, we can't rely on any sort of new uh, newfangled features. Um, and then the, uh, the final thing is that there's, there's a, a significant cost associated with each ping here. Um, we'd like to really minimize the number of requests to our server as possible. Right? So the problem then is, okay, how do you generate, given all of those constraints, how do you generate a unique ID for uh, for each user. Um, so I'm actually curious. So does, does, does anybody have any ideas? Okay, so the MAC address. So uh, so let's let's talk about that for a sec. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of data that's not available in the browser. So for instance, the machine's MAC address is not available. The IP address <laughs> of the machine is not available. Uh, those are things that. I mean, you probably can't even get the MAC address, but you you you, you could maybe get the IP address on the server side. So the, um, uh, the constraint that we have that we don't want to make an extra server call, um, it limits our, 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 our ability to be able to use something like the IP address on the server side to, to return um, uh, you know, some UP. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, so the answer was uh, you can hash through the user history and hash through what what else? The publisher the domain. So. Publisher domain. Okay, okay. So that's so that's that's very interesting. Uh, we'll we'll come come back to that in a second. Um, all right. The um, solution that we uh, that we happened on is this. Um, so this is like pretty old code. I think I, this might li literally be like four year old code. I'm not sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is the UUID function that we use. It's actually not a U, but like a true UUID, just call it a UUID function um, that we use in the JavaScript. So, it's basically, it calls uh, the random number uh, function and um, uh, it, like squashes the result of the random number call into an alphabet of 36 characters. So, this is like, uh, this would be, I guess, A through Z plus, uh, A through Z plus the numbers. Um, and it does this 16 times, and it concatenates all of these into a single string. So you, so you get some string that, that looks like this. Right, so this, this relies on uh, no information about the user's history, no information about, um, you know, about the, uh, the, the machine's IP address or anything that might only, only exist on the server side. Okay, so this, this, this makes sense? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, very useful question to ask here is, okay, um, you know, as chart gets bigger and bigger, we, we need to be assigning these unique IDs to a larger and larger set of users, right? So let's say that we have uh, uh, on the order of uh, 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 one billion users. Um, given, uh, given this algorithm, what's the likelihood that we might randomly generate the same UID for two users? Okay, so let's do some math here. Um, so, okay. Uh, we, we have an alphabet of 36 characters. We have 16 characters total, so that's, that's the number of different UIDs that are out there. Uh, 36 is roughly 2 to the 5.17, so you can do some, uh, some you know, I, don't, I guess that's arithmetic or algebra, I don't know, uh, and get 
it's 2D to 82. I'm not very good at math. Um, uh, so 2D to 82, which is uh, roughly 4.8 times 10 to the 24 possible UIDs out there. Um, so that is uh, that is a lot of UIDs. Um, uh, if we're looking at um, uh, at a billion users, I think the probability that uh, two of these UIDs will uh, will collide is about 10 to the minus 5 percent. So um, here's the actual probability uh, function. Uh, I think this is correct. I like did this while eating lunch this afternoon. So I, don't know. I can uh, if if anyone is interested, I can I can derive this uh, later. But right now, just accept it as truth. <laughs> um, actually, I didn't know that this thing was going to be recorded. So I'm actually kind of embarrassed that like, there's, there, there's probably some mistake here. Um, Okay, so if um, uh, yeah, so if we um, if we have 82 bits, um, uh, we get a collision rate of 10 to the minus 5 percent. If we have 72 bits, we get a collision rate of of, of about uh, 0.01 percent. So 0.01 percent is like sort of acceptable. Like that's that amount of error is um, is smaller than um, anything else in our system. So you know, so we don't care. Um, okay, there's a train wreck here. Um, has anybody seen the train wreck about to happen? I don't think you know enough about the distribution of uh, random numbers uh, with that, that function. We don't know enough about the distribution of random numbers for that function. Um, probably true. The smallest sub subset of random numbers mm -hmm. that, that... We're not looking for cryptographic level security here. Bad no. random is fine for what they're doing. Right. We, we are not looking for actual cryptographic security. We just want random, right? How are you um, seeding it? I'm sorry? How are you seeding the random number? Ah, the seed. So this is a very good question. Uh, it's undefined by the JavaScript spec. All right, so I did some research on this. I, I pulled up this stack overflow page that was like, oh, you're in IE6 and like, it uses this method. Any of you in IE7 uses that method? And I just close the tab because that's enough. Like, I, you know, I'm not going to deal with that problem, right? So, so the seed is, 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 is a real issue. Um, so uh, typically what happens <laughs> is the, uh, the random seed for a uh, uh, for random number generator is um, is based off of the time of day, like the like your your actual system clock. Um, if you're lucky, you get the um, the system clock in microseconds or nanoseconds, but most machines return it in uh, uh, milliseconds, right? So if you if you take that and you also you also take into account, uh, oh, okay. So first off, uh, the clock in milliseconds is typically say 32 bit value, right? So your seed is 32 bits. You're hoping to somehow get uh, 82 bits of like different combinations from 32 bits. That's not going to happen, right? So at best, you could get 32. Uh, in reality, uh, if you're dealing with traffic that's like you know that has the potential to be, to be slash dotted, for instance, right? Lots of people are going, or I don't know, like date. What's what's like the new slash dot now? Um, like all, all these people are going to one page all at once, right? If you you know you make like a reasonable assumption that that the clock is probably uh, set for the same day, then you're not even looking at 32 bits. There you're looking at 26, and if the clock if like all these people are coming in the same hour, then you're looking at 21 bits, right? So the amount of, of uh, differentiation like really decreases uh, fairly quickly. So um, oh, and then there there's there's some other problems as well like. Um, uh, not all browsers will reseed when new tabs uh, show up and stuff like that. There's a lot of variants out there, so it, it was uh, it was actually it was a little bit of a challenging problem for us to like figure out uh, exactly what our collision rate was. Uh, one thing I did was I, um, uh, I I took that UID generation function and I put it into Node um, and, and I just I just ran it like like a hundred million times on my laptop and checked for collisions. And I think uh, on my laptop at that time, the collision rate was something like 5%. Uh, I redid that test recently on, on my, my brand spanking new laptop and the collision rate was zero. So I don't know what's going on there, but uh, it, could be, it could be bad or it could be good, I don't know. Um, uh, something else that you, uh, that you have to keep in mind is the quality of the actual random number generator. Um, and this, this again is platform um, and browser dependent. Uh, most random number generators are somehow uh, are these days are based on the uh, on on the Mersenne twister. Uh, not true of older browsers. Um, older browsers can use like much crappier things. Okay, so uh, right, so recall the uh, the goal here is not necessarily randomization or making our our users anonymous. The goal is to identify our users. So uh, given that, um, how many have seen this site before? One. 
All right, you guys should all go to the site right now because it will probably mess with their data. So, okay, so, so the idea is this. Um, uh, you can take a lot of the information that's available to you um, in the browser to uh, create an identifying fingerprint um, for, uh, for you, right? So some examples of some information that's in the browser is um, uh, what operating system are you running, what plugins have you installed, what order have you installed the plugins, uh, what's your time zone, what's, uh, what's your IP address, um, fonts, right, fonts, yeah. Um, uh, so there's a very uh, there's a very high likelihood that you can um, you can actually um, trace somebody to a single browsing session using just uh, just that information. So uh, as an example, I, I did this this afternoon um, in my office on like you know just a standard MacBook running Chrome, and the thing was able to uh, identify me. Um, you know, I think that's kind of impressive, kind of scary. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's uh, let's let's run through a, a few things here that might be of interest. Okay, so these are things that we consider um, uh, that could be sources of uniqueness for users. Um, so UA is a user agent. Um, these numbers are estimated uh, bits of differentiation or bits of entropy. Um, we just pull these numbers out of our asses. I mean, we would have like no real real basis for this. And and what's more is. Uh, uh, so if you go to the uh, Panopticlick site, it, it tells you like how much um, uh, how much uh, differentiation there is between like the various uh, properties of your browser. Uh, those numbers might not even hold hold in our case, right? Our our um, our base of users might be highly skewed. Like for instance, um, if we have one site that's very mobile heavy, right? Uh, a lot of people are using iPhones. Um, there isn't as much differentiation between iPhones as there is between desktops, right? If our user base is uh, mostly in the U.S., for instance, like three time zones, um, you know, we, we take the time zone information. Uh, you know, for a U.S. site, that's not a great differentiator, but you know, for an international site, that could be, you know, like it could be more than two bits. It could be five bits or something. I don't know. So, uh, so these these numbers were sort of like hand wavy estimates. Um, and if you if you uh, if you take all these numbers and you add them up, they coincidentally get very close to 82. Um, you can mess with these numbers to get that thing arbitrarily posted. Hey, this is not scientific at all. Yeah. Um, ah, so something I should also point out. Uh, so, uh, so the document title and the, and the document path, right? Well, it might be the case that there's a lot of variation between the titles and a lot of variation in the paths. Given some title and some path, like there, there's a very uh, high probability that those two are highly linked. Right? So, um, so we don't get like the full variation there. Um, Another way of saying this is that if we, um, you know, if we if we call like for instance the uh, the time of the clock several times, we don't get more randomness. Um, you know, you you only get the source once. Um, yeah. Are are there any questions about this? All right. So here is an example of um, the output of some of these properties. Right. So the the platform string is really really long. Uh, the font string is similarly very, very long. Um, and then you have like kind of a mix of types of data, like for instance, screen size color depth is three numbers. Um, the, you know, the, the path is a URL. Um, uh, you know, we also look at things like, um, like the document width and, and, and height as well, and the page load time, those are all numbers, right? Uh, so uh, we want our UID to be relatively short and compact, like a small, a, a small string. So there's a question of, okay, how do you, how do you actually take all of this data um, and make this thing into one small short string? Uh, there's uh, there's kind of like a a trick here, which um, which I think is uh, potentially overused, but I love using it everywhere. Um, you just hash things, right? so you can take like all sorts of like crap loads of data, just throw it into a hash function, and the thing will output a string that's relatively unique and is free from collision. Um, I like that technique so much, actually. So I, 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 I just had a baby, um, and I really like the name Olivia, but that's a, a, a very common name. My last name is Child, it's also very common, so I just hashed her name, so. Uh, so now she has a unique name. <laughs> 2 of 31. Uh, okay, so. Um, so, here's, so here's what we did, okay. Um, 
back to that uh, that Trapita.js uh, code size constraint. Um, our, our entire Trapita.js code is around uh, 9k uh, unzipped, uh, uh, but that's minified, right? And that thing is loading all the time. Um, so we can't just load in whatever hash function we want. Um, the, the smallest uh, correctly functioning uh, SHA-1 JavaScript function we found uh, was about 1,500 bytes. Um, there are SHA-1 implementations that claim to be smaller than that. In particular, we found one that was 500 bytes. Uh, in our testing, it's actually, we found that is wrong. Uh, so we did a lot of like searching around for, uh, for, small, for small things. And we can't load in a crypto library. I mean, you know, the, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the size of that would just be too big. Um, and then we also have to have this thing so that it runs on all browsers. Um, uh, so we can't use any sort of built-in, you know, like the HTML5 crypto library or something like that, right? Uh, so, uh, Charpy loves to, we love doing internal competitions, like, like code competitions and things. These are all, like, in, in good fun. Um, uh, so what I did was I suggested, okay, let's, let's have a competition. Um, why don't we go and invent a hash function? This sounds like fun. Um, and, you know, uh, it's actually, I think it's an easy problem because uh, I, I decided, you know, through CTO Fiat that um, our, uh, our U keys would be 160-bit uh, numbers, I guess, and when you convert that into, uh, into something of base 64, it's around 23, 24 characters, I think. Um, so, you know, let's just take 160-bit target space. You know, we have about 80 bits, like 79, 80 bits of unique information that we're putting into it. So taking 80 bits of data um, and hashing it into 160 bit space is easy. I mean that, you know, the, the 160 bit space is um, uh, trillions and trillions of times larger than the 80 bit space, right? So it, you know, like it, should be, it should be no problem, it's not crazy, right? So, so I thought, okay, you, you know, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll let the devs like, work on this for a couple of hours, it'll be a fun thing, and then we'll, you know, we'll have some beer and have a competition, we have a prize, and you know, everything will be great and jolly. Um, okay, so how do we, um, how do you decide what hash function is the best? Uh, so the first thing is that we, we have a real world input set. Um, so the hash function has to produce zero collisions on that. Uh, the second property is this. We, um, uh, for, you know, for some of our applications, we use this uh, probabilistic data structure called hyperlog log. Uh, hyperlog log depends on a property of the hash function. Um, in particular, the, uh, the hash function has to have what's good, or what's, what's known as good avalanching behavior. So basically, it needs to be very well distributed. Uh, the intuition there is, uh, if you if you change, if if you have uh, some input and then you hash it and you get some value, and then you change one bit in the input, the resulting hash, uh, about half of those bits should have changed from the uh, from the first half hash. If that makes sense. Um, and then. Uh, you know, if for, for all solutions that uh, that fit, um, you know, that, that pass those two tests, then the la the tiebreaker would be uh, code size. Um, okay, so I thought this would just be a few hours, um, you know, and it would be like a side project for the engineers. It turned into this like all-consuming exercise. Um, like people were like coming up with all sorts of scripts for uh, for testing testing input sets and. Um, and like doing a lot of research into like how hash functions are designed and stuff like how hash functions are designed is uh, it's magical. Um, uh, it, you know, it's like a black art. Um, and, you know, at some point our VB eventually. So you know, there was, there, was, there was like one night in which like four engineers like were there until midnight just work, working on the hash function. At some point our VB engineering had to sort of like say, okay, guys, cool it. You know, so it's not really that um, that important. Uh, so okay, so I'm going to run through a couple of of, um, of example hash functions that um, that we ran through this competition. Um, okay, DJB hash. Um, DJB. So that's uh, Dan J Bernstein. Um, he is a mathematician and software engineer. Um, he developed uh, a well-known piece of software called QMail. Uh, QMail was what, um, or it is, I, I think, uh, the thing that backs Yahoo Mail. It's basically, it's a mail. Um, uh, it's a server. Uh, he invented this this hash function, which is very simple and very widely used. Um, uh, one one characteristic of of, um, of all hash functions that I know of is that they, they have some some kind of an internal state. Um, sometimes it's one number, sometimes it's a vector of numbers. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's, it's some state that gets that gets passed through the input and mutated over and over again, and then the state is the result of the hash. So in this case, uh, he starts off with this number fifty three eighty one. Uh, he runs through every character, takes the ordinal value of the character, multiplies the hash by 33, adds it, and then adds the ordinal value. 
Makes sense, right? That's obvious. Right? Um, this is a very simple hash that in practice performs well, right? But you might be asking, um, you know, if you're a good software engineer, you might be asking, what are these magic numbers? 5381, where did you come up with that? 33, what is that for? Right? Zero, oh, that's so suspicious. <laughs> so, um, uh, a lot of hash functions have these properties. So this is, this is what is said about DJB. If one experimentally tests all multipliers between 1 and 256, one detects that even numbers are not usable at all. The remaining 128 odd numbers work more or less all equally well. They all distribute in, in an acceptable way, and this way you fill a hash table with an average percent of approximately 86%. And this is like sort of empirically tested. On one input set, you have no idea. Um, you know, if one compares the chi-squared values of the variance, I don't even know what chi-squared values are. <laughs> I used to. Um, uh, so uh, DJB himself says, uh, practically any good multiplier works. I think you're worrying about the fact that 31C, he was responding to somebody who changed the 33 to 31 so that it would be a little bit faster. Um, doesn't cover any, uh, any reasonable range of hash values of C and D are between 0 and 255. That's why when I discovered the 33 hash function, right, discovered, not derived, but discovered, right, <laughs> the 33 hash function and started using it in my compressors, I started with a hash value of 5381. I think you will find that this does just as well as a 261 multiplier. Uh, like, whatever. <laughs> um, all right. This is also a very, uh, a, a very common simple hash function. Um, Fuller null vo. I think I'm pronouncing that correct. Um, so, uh, FNV is very similar to uh, DJB, except that uh, so in DJB you've got um, uh, sorry you've got uh, you've got this uh, this plus right there. Um, what FNV basically does is change that into into an XOR. Um, for some reason, that tends to make uh, so uh, right, so that and uh, and the multiplication by prime uh, tends to make hash functions have uh, good avalanche behavior. I don't know why. I'm not a mathematician, so uh, I'll just I'll just cross the internet on this. Um, okay. Uh, here is the current granddaddy of all hash functions, SHA-1, right? Uh, so this is just a snippet of the main loop in pseudocode, right? This isn't even real code. This thing is complex, um, uh, and it's got all sorts of magic numbers, right? So for for i from zero to seventy nine. So we're going to do this thing eighty times. Um, sounds good, right? So for the first 20 times, we're going to do that with that number. For the next 20 times, we're going to do that and use that number. And it, you know, it's just, I, I'm sure these things like actually mean something to someone who's smarter than me, but to me, like, this is meaningless. Like, my, my eye sort of plays over this, right? You do all this computation, and at the end, you just sort of sum them all up. You perform a couple of left shifts, and that's the answer, right? But somehow, this thing is, uh, is like, fantastic. So. Okay. So uh, what happened was our engineers um, they they did all this research. They looked at all these these uh, you know these well-known hash functions, and they generally um, uh, submitted variants of uh, of these existing functions. Um, we had some that were very complex, some that were very simple. Um, uh, the best simple ones tend to tend to look a lot like F and V. So in fact, this this guy is basically F and V, except that uh, I believe this constant is different. And there is no seed state. It starts with zero. Uh, so, so, so this, if you know, if you care about hash function, this is actually a little bit suspicious. You know, that you start from a zero seed state all the time. Uh, in practice, for our data set, it doesn't. It, it didn't matter. Um, I would guess that if you are, uh, uh, if you care about these things, it does make a big difference. Uh, the reason why. Uh, so, right. So, it turns out that a bunch of the engineers submitted solutions that passed the. Uh, Collision tests, like they were fine for HLL and they produced no collisions. Um, the reason is, you know, so so we went into the tiebreaker, and the reason why this guy won is because the seed state, because it's all zeros, made it just a couple of bytes smaller than the next best one. Um, so okay, so this guy won. Um, you can ignore all of this. This is just uh, generating a um, a string from uh, from that value. Uh, so. Um, we went through all of this. It was it, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, in the end, uh, we actually did not uh, use this solution. Uh, we just used SHA-1. Uh, what we did was we, we took we took the uh, the fourteen hundred or fifteen hundred byte version of SHA-1 that we found, and one of our engineers sort of just like hand wrangled it uh, so that it was under a K. I gave him a threshold of a K. Like we'll use SHA-1 if it's less than one K. There, there should be a term for this, like yak shading or something. Yeah, it's like. I, I don't know, like, you know, like orange squeezing or <laughs> towel, you know, towel, I, I don't know. Golf. 
so uh, uh, yeah, okay, so uh, he was able to do it. Um, he got this thing down uh, to under 1K, uh, and then if you throw in G's of compression, it's actually, it's, it's uh, pretty good. Um, uh, one reason why we shied away from this and picked Chao one was because our uh, chief data scientist was a little bit afraid of like, you know, what if we invented a hash function that looks good right now, but is absolutely terrible in the future, and people will make fun of us for doing this? <laughs> Let's just use Shao one right? It's like nobody got fired for using Shao one um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the very important question you guys should all be asking right now is, what was the prize of this competition? Um, this is an actual book, uh, published, I don't know when, like probably like 40 years ago or something, uh, first, but the most recent edition, I think, was published in the last 10 years. Um, let me show you a page out of this book. Um, yeah, uh, the book actually comes, it's really pretty fascinating. It comes with, uh, like the practice is an algorithm for how to pick random numbers from this book. And it involves like flipping to a random page, uh, taking one of these numbers, and then converting it into another page number, and flipping to that one, and then marking columns if you use it, and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm sorry? Who wrote the book? Oh, who wrote the book? Good question. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you should be able to find it on Amazon. Um, Okay. Oh, oh was, was, was it actually on the cover? It said front cover. Yeah. yeah. Copyrighted material. Yeah, it says copyrighted material. That guy was very prolific. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, here's some reviews from Amazon. Such a terrific record score. But with so many terrific random digits, it's a shame they didn't sort them to make it easier to find one. Uh, while the printed version is good, I would have expected the publisher to have an audiobook version as well. A companion for one's iPod. This guy, this guy was an ass and gave it a one-star review. The book is a promising reference concept, but the execution is somewhat sloppy. Whatever generator they use was not fully tested. The bulk of each page seems random enough, however, at the lower left and lower right of alternate pages, the number is found to increment the reference. And of course, uh, they're, they're actually making a sequel for this book. So, um, uh, after, as they're doing all this, after they're taking in all the sources of entropy, and, uh, you know, uh, squeezing this uh, Sha one like, down to a uh, to a manageably small piece of code, uh, what's our collision rate at the end? Uh, 0.03%. So this is pretty good. And, and in fact, we don't, we don't even think that it's truly 0.03%. Um, what, what happens is, if you, if you examine our logs for these situations, um, uh, it, it appears that, that, uh, that pings are being sent from, uh, from browsers like multiple times, like the exact same ping. So we think it's legitimately, it's when, when there's a collision, it's actually it's the same user. And we haven't looked into why. Point oh three percent is small, but it doesn't really matter. Yep. I, I thought there was a SHA-2 now. Did you guys evaluate that? Yeah, so we, we didn't look at any of the uh, the newer SHA variants. Um, no good reason, except that, yeah, you know, SHA-1 is good enough. And you know, like, the reason why you might want to use the other SHA variants is if you care about uh, cryptographic um, uh, integrity, and that's something that we don't, don't care about. You know? um, so, yeah, it was just good enough. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so we've sort of gotten this down to a, uh, to a manual level. Um, okay, so that was my talk. <laughs> um, we are hiring, of course, uh, we're hiring not just JavaScript people or people who like hash functions. Uh, we're hiring on the front end, the back end, um, uh, some data science, the side end, the rear end, I don't know. <laughs> All ends. Um, are, are there any questions? Yeah. Do you guys consider just hiring an expert that might be able to help you? <laughs> in, okay, so did we consider hiring an expert yeah, to help us? Serious, yeah, in, in retrospect, maybe that would have been a reasonable thing to do. Um, I originally thought it was literally going to take every, like, everyone one hour, so it was, net, right, like in that case, like, it doesn't really matter. Um, in the end, like, maybe the cost of the time, yes. Um, but you could argue that you know, those engineers were probably not staying until midnight to do normal work anyway, so maybe it was free time. Yeah, so if you're using browser fingerprinting, would it be a problem if you're using cloaking extensions to randomize the strings? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so that, that might be a problem. Uh, more likely though, like, like the, the thing that actually poses more of a practical issue for us is if you're, if you're into that, you might just be blocking JavaScript. Um, if you're blocking JavaScript, there isn't much we can do. So. Um, so I suspect in practice that's not really a big problem for us. Um, 
But what is, uh, I think, more of a problem, like along those lines, is uh, lots of people will have the, um, the most recent version of the iPhone, like um, uh, iOS on the most recent iPhone, in which case you'll get the same fingerprint. Um, there, uh, because we don't have IP address, which is like a rough uh, proxy of, of location, um, there the only thing that would distinguish you would be, um, uh, would be like your time zone or something like that. Uh, one thing that one engineer suggested actually is uh, you can apparently in JavaScript without prompting the user, um, you can access um, orientation of the device. So like if it's tilted or not, and maybe we could use that as a source of entry. We didn't end up doing it, um, but yeah, we might throw that in at some point, this would be fun. Yep. Uh, can you go into a little more detail about the issue with third party cookies and why couldn't you use yeah. some marker on the browser uh, for basically generating a number once and then reusing it over the session? Yeah, okay, so the issue um, why uh, why don't we do third party cookies and uh, you know, why can we just generate some number once and use it over and over again? Um, so, uh, uh, the privacy laws in the EU are much stricter than in, in the US. So, so there, there are two answers for third-party cookies. The first is that the privacy laws in the, in, in the EU are stricter than the privacy laws in the US. Um, and it's just easier to manage those if you don't ever use third-party cookies. Sorry, I didn't mean necessarily third-party cookie. Oh, okay. Uh, you are executing JavaScript on somebody else's page. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have a problem of saying I'm a first-party cookie. Yes, so we can set up first-party cookies. And, 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 and actually, once we generate that UID, we store it, we store it in a cookie either cookie or local storage, depending on what your browser capability is, uh, so that the next time that you come to that same domain, you get the same UID. Right. So we do generate the UID only once per user going to some site, but we generate a different UID if you go to a different domain that is a customer of ours, because, because it's stored in the first place. Could you guys make a request for an image from the server and then pass a random ID? Yeah, so, okay, so that's a good question. So couldn't we make a request um, uh, to a server that would then return random information? Is that yeah, based, on the IP based, based on the IP address? Yeah. One of the, of the routes that we went through actually was, um, what, if we, uh, what if we got our CDN to do something for us? So in this case, it was uh, Akamai. Um, and we asked them, you know, like, can, can, you, can you basically just run, just call UUID and like, return it to us somehow? Um, and they were not really able to come up with a solution that was not prohibitively costly. Um, so maybe they could have done it, but in the end, like, yeah, like, uh, we, just, we, just, we just can't afford it. Um, the second thing is, is that it's, um, it's the, the way that our things work is that we, we load in uh, an image. Um, it's really difficult to get data back through that image. Um, I think we have access to the return, the HTTP return code, right? But I don't think there's anything else. It's, it's not like JSON where we're, we're like executing something, um, you know, uh, on, you, you know, we're, we're not like running some piece of, uh, some piece of like arbitrary code that can just get data back. So. You could only get the header information, so you could, you know, embed something in there. Yeah, we could embed something in there. Uh, oh, right, so, so there's also, there's a, uh, the, there's a third, there's a third consideration, which is that we, we want our, our, uh, our pain protocol to be as simple as possible. We want to be able to, like once the page loads, we'd like to be able to just send the data off and not have to, do one request to get the UID before we can send the data off. Um, there are probably ways for us to engineer around that, um, but um, the way that the system sort of evolved, like you know, that when when Charbeat was small, that random UID function was totally adequate, and then uh, at some point when Charbeat got big, you know, then we had to go go and look at that again, and it was like sort of too much effort to redesign the process of the thing. So. Okay, one more. Uh, the mouse. Oh yeah. Okay. So, do we look at the mouse pointer position to um, uh, to as, as a source of entropy? Um, I honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, if we're not, we should be. <laughs> well, but you still don't get iPhone. Which, I'm sorry. You still don't get iPhone, which sounds like right, we still anyway. Right. Right. So on the iPhone, we we still don't get the mouse position on the iPhone. Yeah. Um, we did do things like like page load time and stuff, which is I don't know, kind of you know, an idea of like what's happening like in the browser, like when the thing uh, starts up. But, all right, thanks.